Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm not the chairman of this session, but um, I would like to announce something. Um, the, the invitation card for tomorrow's um, conference banquet is incorrect. In the original invitation card address is incorrect. So for those who want to go there by yourself, um, please uh, get a new card <laughs> replacement. And also the address is also on the, on, the, uh, on, the, uh, on the board. So write down the correct address. And um, so if you are going, um, <clears throat> taking our bus, then it's, it's okay. Don't, don't need to uh, uh, change the card. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, so that's the good part for banquet. But, uh, another good part is the, our keynote. Okay. So the keynote this session is uh, uh, Eric uh, Lieber. Uh, he's as you know he is uh, he has a degree from University of Minnesota. As is now a Rudy professor of economics at Indiana University. And also he is also a member of research council at the uh, uh, German Central Bank. And, of the European Economic Review. Okay, so this, uh, please join me to welcome uh, 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 speech, okay? Hi, uh, it's always a pleasure to be back in Taiwan since I grew up in Asia. I uh, feel like I'm returning to my home, my hometown. Uh, it's different than in Indiana. Uh, okay, so I'm going to talk about fiscal sustainability, which is obviously a topic on a lot of people's minds these days. Um, I think there's an awful lot of confusion about fiscal sustainability, though, and I'm hoping that maybe uh, some of what I say will clear up some of that confusion. Okay, so it's hard to be conscious in the last eight years and not have government debt on your mind. Uh, the U.S. and the U.K. have been engaging in fiscal austerity uh, for quite a while. Uh, although, because of all of our aging populations, our big problems really lie in the future. Um, I remember going to a conference at University of Tokyo, and uh, there were about eight papers presented that were testing whether or not fiscal policy in Japan was sustainable. Uh, guess what they concluded? <laughs> Um, but I think the real poster child these days is the Eurozone. Uh, they engaged in severe austerity even in the midst of, uh, of, uh, of the financial crisis recession. And then there was a second uh, recession that was triggered by sovereign debt crisis. And we kind of all know that that crisis is not really over. Um, it's going to happen more and more uh, in coming years, I think. Now, the problem, partly when you talk about fiscal policy, is that politics gets in the way all the time. And, um, and so I want to try to get beyond that and get beyond kind of the hysteria about high government debt uh, and talk about uh, some things uh, regarding government debt. First of all, what it does, how it gets valued, and then what the consequences of rapid uh, debt growth might be. So some of the roles that government debt plays are, well, it's usually a safe store of value. Um, you know, agents put their savings into government bonds in order to smooth their consumption in the face of volatile income. That role of government debt is in all of our models. Um, it also permits governments to uh, smooth taxes and spending, uh, and so that avoids uh, fiscal policy being an additional source of instability. Um, but then roles that are now starting to get more attention and I think are really central are uh, the role that government debt plays as collateral or liquidity. Um, you know, you can convert treasuries to cash at very low cost. And, uh, and what we saw in the crisis was that uh, treasuries became uh, or were a very important source for uh, backing uh, repurchase agreements and other kinds of uh, credit transactions. So there are models now that are, are trying to get a handle on this. 
it's still this role of government debt still doesn't seem to uh, have made an appearance in kind of the canonical new Keynesian models that people are using. Um, but I think that's just a matter of time. And then in many countries, government debt is, a, is an important form of uh, foreign reserves. Uh, you can use treasuries to acquire foreign currency, uh, which then gets used uh, for exchange rate interventions, as in South Korea. Or treasuries get used as a, a channel for uh, uh, private savings, as I think uh, occurs in China. Uh, and the fourth role is now appearing in some models, too, but not very systematically. Um, now, one really critical distinction is between real and nominal debt. So every paper that I've seen today that has government debt has real debt. And, um, and this distinction between real and nominal debt is critical. So real debt is denominated in units of goods. So uh, this arises whenever uh, debt is in units whose quantity the government cannot control. So it could be indexed to inflation. Uh, a lot of government bonds are. Uh, you could be issuing debt in foreign currency. Under a gold standard, it was essentially uh, government debt was promises to pay in gold. Uh, it could be in asparagus or bok choy or anything, right? That is a real uh, uh, entity, real good. Now, in the U.S., about, only about 10% of government debt is indexed to inflation. The U.K. probably has more than most countries, and that's somewhere in the neighborhood of 15 20%. Now, index debt is like debt under the gold standard. Um, and, and I say that because under the gold standard, governments didn't control the price level. Uh, and so, in effect, um, the government debt, even though it might have uh, paid off in dollars, those dollars were convertible into gold. And so it was a lot like real debt. So real debt is a claim to goods in the future. And the government has to acquire those goods in order to honor its obligations. And it can acquire those goods either through direct taxes or through seniorage revenue, um, you know, money creation. And what I want to emphasize here is in both cases, whether it's direct taxes or seniorage, um, the debt is being backed by goods, OK? Because the seniorage is extracting goods from the private sector. And in the case where a government can't acquire goods or won't acquire goods, default is the only option. Now, nominal debt is very different. It's denominated in home currency, which I'll call dollars, since we're in Taiwan. Um, and by the way, I think all Taiwanese debt is in nominal terms, uh, as far as I can tell. And this arises whenever debt is in units whose supply the government can control. And so this is the vast majority of government debt out there. Uh, surprisingly, even countries like uh, Brazil uh, a big fraction of their um, debt is denominated in home currency. So the critical thing here is that the government doesn't need to be able to acquire goods to pay off nominal debt. It can just print up new dollars to reduce the market value of debt. And in this case, then, default is a lot less likely. So this distinction between real and nominal debt carries important policy implications. So think about the euro area. Even though uh, you might think, well, they're all issuing it in euros, and, uh, and the EA, or the euro area, controls the supply of euros, that's not really true, right? Greece does not control the ECB. And so in effect, your euro area debt is real debt. And default on real debt is a lot more likely. And you can see from this chart that, um, that this default probability gets embedded in uh, risk premia. So I contrast the, the blue are euro area countries, the red are not. And you can see that there are very high levels of debt here and very low uh, bond yields um, and, e and much more moderate uh, levels of debt in Europe and uh, uh, are associated with higher bond yields. 
And that's because those are embedding this uh, probability of, uh, of the default. So if you remember the uh, good old days, <clears throat> Um, this was what uh, uh, monetary union was supposed to deliver, right? This great convergence of interest rates. And so uh, at the beginning, interest rates were really very different. These are all 10-year uh, bond yields. And then right around this time, uh, lots of people were declaring what a great success uh, monetary union was. And then stuff happened. Um, and so we went to this from a great convergence to a great divergence in uh, nominal rates. Now, what I've put up here is, um, is part of what I want to talk about. What you'll notice here is that governments run into sovereign debt problems at very different levels of debt. OK, so there's a lot of heterogeneity across countries in what you might think of as what I'm going to call the fiscal limit. You know, when do countries run into trouble? Well, it isn't just 60%, like the Maastricht uh, Treaty says. Um, there are countries like Belgium, which I don't even have up here, uh, that have had very high debt for a long time with no risk premium at all. Um, and, and our theories have to come to terms with that. OK. So let's talk about how does government debt get valued. Now, one thing that I, I, I'm always struggling with when I talk to policy people is, um, you know, if you have an asset, there's always a backward representation and a forward representation. So you can think of government debt as just the accumulation of all past deficits. And that's true. In an accounting sense, that's right. But that isn't how debt gets its value. It gets its value in a forward-looking sense. And, um, and so you can think of government debt as being like any other asset. Its value depends on the expected discounted cash flows. And cash flows, in the case of government debt, are primary surpluses. Okay, So that is the surplus not including interest payments. Um, and so, <clears throat> excuse me. So revenues in excess of non-interest spending are the, quote, goods that back real government debt. OK? So this is simply um, the mathematical representation of a debt valuation equation. It says that the, the value of government debt outstanding equals the expected discounted present value of primary surpluses. OK? So that's how real debt gets valued. Um, so what are some important things to keep in mind? First of all, debt valuation is forward-looking. Okay? It's not about what you did in the past. It's what people think you're going to be doing in the future. Um, so if you have higher debt, that requires you to have higher discounted surpluses. Or alternatively, if you announce a path of higher surpluses, then you, you're providing more backing to government debt, and that can support a higher level of debt, OK? Um, but it's also the case that higher discount factors or lower uh, discount rates will permit a given stream of surpluses to support higher um, real claims. Now, the critical thing for this distinction between real and nominal debt is that in this valuation equation, there's nothing nominal appearing, OK? There are no price levels or anything like that. OK, now, if we think about the euro area, um, we're thinking about real debt. And, um, and every country faces a fiscal limit. And this is defined as just the point at which, for economic or more often political reasons, uh, a country can just no longer raise surpluses in order to finance its debt. And as I suggested, um, the fiscal limit varies greatly across countries, and it also across time. And it's going to depend on a whole bunch of country-specific details, and I just list some of them here. Um, and what you'll notice is, yeah, there are a lot of economic uh, considerations here, but there are also a lot of political economy considerations. You know, if you're in Sweden, um, the Swedes, and I have Swedish blood, so I can say this, you know, please tax me more. 
Um, you know, we're, we're, uh, we're already on the wrong side of the Laffer curve, but that's OK. Um, if you're in the United States and you, you talk about raising taxes, you know, you, you get shot. Because um, we're into shooting people, too. Um, so that's obviously just political economy. Um, and, um, and then, the, you know, what you expect policy to be in the future, is, because that's going to determine the stream of surpluses, um, is really important. And so the political considerations, I think, are, are, are part of what really doesn't get built into our models very uh, systematically. And, uh, but it, it is important for thinking about this fiscal limit. So the idea of the fiscal limit is it's not the level of government debt per se that matters for how risky it is. It's how close that debt is to the fiscal limit. And so I'm going to talk about a way, um, one way of trying to uh, quantify what this fiscal limit looks like. And this is due to Hui Xin Bi, uh, her papers in the European Economic Review. So she just has a, a representative agent. It's kind of an RBC kind of model. Um, household worker buys consumption goods and bonds, supplies labor, um, and there's random technology. Uh, and basically all this consumer is doing is trying to smooth consumption. So then the government levies a distorting tax against labor income. And it purchases goods. But the really important thing, and this is why so many countries are running into fiscal problems, is transfers. And, uh, and we can think about there being two states, two regimes for transfers. One is this nice stationary uh, regime where you just bounce around the steady state level. And the other, which really reflects aging populations, um, is explosive. And so transfers as a share of GDP are growing. And what happens is, um, as you, if you go into this explosive regime, uh, you, you pay for the transfers by issuing more bonds and by raising this distorting tax. But at some point, you reach the, the limit of what you can extract uh, in terms of tax revenues, because they're distorting. And so you hit maximum uh, revenues at the peak of a Laffer curve. And so this, these are just examples of the Laffer curve and how they vary when you've got tax evasion or a high labor elasticity. But the basic idea here is that there's only so much revenue that you can extract um, when taxes are distorting. And so um, the fiscal limit then is defined as the present value of maximum primary surpluses. And in Hui Xin's work, uh, she drives uh, the economy to the peak of the Laffer curve. And, um, and of course, there are shocks hitting, right? So that peak is moving around. And, uh, and then she drives expenditures to some minimum level. And that's where political economy comes in. You know, is your population going to tolerate having government spending be zero? Um, is there, how do you decide what that is? But again, there are shocks there. Um, and so then the idea here is that uh, what this fiscal limit looks like is, it, is it's a probability distribution. It's going to depend on the shocks that are hitting the economy today and what you expect will happen uh, going forward. Okay, so the fiscal limit then answers the question, given some economic environment, what is the distribution of government debt that can be supported? So as I, as I said, what's really critical here is that this is uncertain. It's a probability distribution. And it's forward looking. It's going to depend on what people think policy is going to do in the future and how credible the policies that are being announced are. And when you think about some of the reforms that have been uh, proposed in Europe in some of the countries that uh, are facing the fiscal limit, uh, you can see how important this issue of credibility is. Um, and then it's going to depend on private behavior, policy behavior, and whatever shocks are hitting the economy. Okay, so what you do then is you, you can derive this fiscal limit distribution um, by computing what this, uh, the expected present value of maximum primary surpluses are. And you just take a bunch of draws from the, uh, the fundamental shocks, and that, that gives you what the distribution looks like. So this is an example that's calibrated to uh, Greek data. Just to show you how important 
the shocks are. So in the left panel, we're looking at different, this is uh, the CDF of the, of the uh, fiscal limit. Um, and this is uh, looking at different levels of productivity today. So this vertical line is roughly what Greek debt was, uh, about 170%. And, uh, and the blue is just if productivity is kind of sitting at steady state. And what happens is if you get a good productivity draw and it's persistent, then that pushes the fiscal limit away from you. Okay? And that then uh, results in, at any given level of debt, lower risk premium. But of course, if you have bad productivity draws, then that pushes the fiscal limit closer to you, and that makes the debt more risky. So this is conditional on a given level of government debt today. All right? And so this is the point that it's not what your debt is today that matters. It's what your debt is relative to this fiscal limit. Uh, distribution. But where you get a lot of kick is from this transfers process. Because if you're in this unstable uh, regime, transfers are growing as a share of GDP, as they are in most of our countries, then the fiscal limit is really close, right? Because it depends on primary surpluses. And expenditures are growing uh, as a share of GDP. And that translates directly into higher risk premiums. Whereas if you, if you convert to a regime of stable transfers, then that pushes the fiscal limit out. So <clears throat> um, I find this to be a very useful framework for thinking about uh, sovereign risk. Um, it's not about strategic default or anything like that. But this environment allows you to develop a very rich model of what the uh, fiscal environment looks like. And, uh, and allows you to ask a bunch of questions, like if we adopt this fiscal reform, what will happen to this fiscal limit distribution? And, uh, and so I think it's very useful. OK, so as I said, this current debt alone is not a sufficient statistic. Um, and this limit is now being used in some places. So Slovakia's Council for Budget Responsibility um, adapted a version of this model to their economy and decided that the safe level of debt for Slovakia is about 40% uh, as a share of GDP rather than the Maastricht 60. Um, and then I think it can also be used, as I said, to evaluate consequences of various kinds of fiscal reforms that are being con considered. And the IMF and the ECB are now thinking about trying to use this fiscal limit concept um, as a basis for policy advice. OK, but now, what if debt is nominal? Well, if debt is nominal, then we don't use this valuation equation anymore, where all the adjustments have to come through this present value of surpluses, because we now have some nominal stuff showing up. So we're thinking here that B is like a bond portfolio. It reflects all the maturity structure in the, in, uh, the bonds. And Q then becomes the price of that portfolio. And P is the price level. Okay, so this is going to convert dollars into goods because this is the right hand side is the same, right? Because that's the goods that are backing uh, debt. Um, but now, if you think about what's happening at time t, if information arises that changes the, your expectation of these primary surpluses, now both the bond price and the price level can adjust. Um, to uh, establish equilibrium. So that means that um, we now have other mechanisms for adjusting uh, to changes in primary surpluses or in the amount of outstanding bonds uh, than we have when you have only uh, real debt. OK? And that's what I want to talk about is the broader implications of this. OK, so suppose the economy is near its fiscal limit. So that's like saying, OK, we've gone about as far as we can go in terms of uh, surpluses, right? So the right-hand side is more or less fixed. Um, if nominal debt continues to grow, but nobody's expecting that nominal debt to get backed by higher uh, uh, real surpluses in the future, 
then the dollar value of this debt rises. But the real value of that debt is fixed by the goods that are backing it. And so the price level has to rise or bond prices have to fall um, in order to make the real value of debt consistent with what you're expecting uh, surpluses to uh, be. And so the possibility that the price level might end up coming out um, of this expression is heretical. Um, <clears throat> it doesn't show up in, in monetarist uh, environments or in, any, in most of the new Keynesian models. Um, and so I'm going to push on that a little bit. Okay, so how does this work? We've got to talk about the economics. You know, it's not enough to say there's an equilibrium condition and if the right-hand side does this, the left-hand side does that. That's not economics. I keep trying to tell my students that. Um, so what is the economics? So suppose that the government cuts taxes and it can somehow promise that they're never going to raise them again. Okay? Well, in that environment, households who are receiving those tax cuts are going to feel wealthier. And they're going to want to convert that wealth into goods. They want to raise their consumption path. Um, how are they going to do that? They're going to get out of holding bonds and into buying goods. But that increase in demand for goods is going to raise the dollar price of goods. And the price level will rise, or future price levels will rise, bond prices will fall, until equilibrium is reestablished. And the exact split between current, you can think of bond prices as future inflation. And uh, so the exact split between current inflation and future inflation is going to depend on what monetary policy does. Um, now, how much inflation you have to, you have to generate, you know, sort of in a present value sense, is nailed down by, by this present value of surpluses. Uh, but the precise split between current and future is going to depend on what monetary policy does. Um, this is what I would call, what I'm calling an unbacked fiscal expansion. Okay, so you do a fiscal expansion, but you don't back it by raising by future taxes. Okay, which seems mystical to people. Um, but the key here is to understand that these bonds are just promises to dollars in the future. And if you can print those dollars, then there's nothing mystical about this. Um, OK. Now, the thing is that in the euro area, um, when a government issues debt, it doesn't have any choice but to raise future surpluses or default. Um, and Because this kind of revaluation that I just talked about through the price level is not possible. Um, and I think this goes a long way toward explaining why sovereign debt crises are so prevalent in Europe today, in countries that issue foreign uh, currency-linked debt, and historically, countries that are on metallic standards. Um, these are all countries who don't control their price level. Um, now, one option uh, available to real debt issuers who control their own monetary policy, uh, meaning not the Eurozone members, is that you can print money to generate seniorage revenues. Uh, but I really want to emphasize that the mechanism that I'm talking about, this unbacked fiscal expansion, is not the same thing as seniorage. Uh, because seniorage is just another form of taxation. So it's just another form of, um, of backing the debt with real goods. Uh, what I'm talking about, this unbacked thing, you are not adjusting real goods in the future. Okay. Uh, I'll skip this and look at this picture. So this is just a picture of uh, inflation rates, the yellow, uh, the, the, uh, the yellow lines. <laughs> Sorry, it's 5 o'clock in the morning, and <laughs> my body's wondering what I'm doing. Uh, no, th this is red. This is blue. OK. So the red lines are inflation. The blue lines are policy rates. And the only thing I want you to take from this um, aside from the fact that inflation has been pretty low in a lot of countries recently, is that policy rates since the crisis have just not been at all responding to inflation. OK? Um, so let's think about what Japan's been up to. As we all know, um, it's, uh, it's been kind of mired in, uh, I don't know, low inflation, low growth for a long time. And at the same time, uh, government debt has grown a lot. 
as a share of GDP. Now, when Abe took over, he had these three arrows, right? Monetary expansion, fiscal stimulus, and structural reform. Um, now, Japan raised the consumption tax uh, from 3 to 5% in 1997, and then raised it again in April of 2014 from 5 to 8%. Um, this was largely due to pressure from the IMF. Um, and uh, this is a quotation from IMF that basically says, yeah, do more of it. You've got to raise taxes. I mean, look, this is an economy that's, that's been struggling for decades. And the IMF solution is raise taxes. Um, now, the finance minister committed to raise taxes again in 2017. So they postponed the, tw the scheduled 2016 rise. Um, but Abe now seems to be sending some different signals. My point here is that Japan is choosing to treat nominal debt as if it's real. And the IMF doesn't understand the difference between the two. And so they're treating this nominal debt as real debt as well. Um, and so here's what happened. Uh, they were starting to show some signs of life. Inflation was starting to pick up. Then the consumption tax went up. And, um, and it's down back where it was, right? Um, OK, now let's think about Switzerland and Sweden. So these are two countries, and a lot of European countries, in fact, by, by law or something, <laughs> they're required. Members of the euro area are now required to come up with fiscal rules um, and fiscal councils. Um, these are two countries that are not part of the euro area. but. Um, they, they have serious fiscal rules. And what I mean by serious is not the way we talk about rules in the US, because <laughs> they actually follow them. Um, so in Switzerland, they have a debt break. And in Sweden, they have a net lending target. And the question I want to ask, which they haven't been asking, is do these fiscal rules um, provide the kind of fiscal backing needed for monetary policy to be able to control inflation? Um, and I think that the, their experiences raise some questions. So Sweden and Switzerland stand out as maybe the only countries in the world where debt-GDP ratio either fell or was constant during this crisis. Um, I, I think that's, this is a really stunning picture. I don't think it's a coincidence, by the way, that they can't seem to get their inflation rates up to target. Now, I was in Sweden just a little while ago, and they're sort of declaring victory because they are moving in the right direction. Um, but I think this is another case where um, the understanding of how monetary and fiscal policy have to interact, have to be consistent with each other, isn't understood very well. And, uh, um, and, this, and by the way, they, they, they both have very negative int nominal interest, uh, interest rates. Um, policy rates, I mean. But they aren't the only ones. Uh, these are uh, uh, yield curves. This is for, Swi uh, for Switzerland. So what you can see in Switzerland, they have negative nominal yields on government bonds out 10 years. Let that sink in for a while. So when you teach students, the usual thing we used to teach them was that there's a zero bound on nominal rates, right? And then, then the world happened. And, uh, and now you have to try to explain this to them. <laughs> um, a similar but less severe picture uh, is in Sweden. Uh, they have very negative rates out five years. Now, I look at this picture, and, and I think this is the strongest evidence I can find for bad fiscal policy. So think about this. You have, you have private agents are telling the government that they will pay the government to borrow from them over a five-year horizon, and the government won't do it. Now, I, I mean, that's just colossally bad policy. Um, but this is all part of this obsession with fiscal austerity. Uh, you know, low debt is good debt. Um, this is sh telling me that there's a shortage of debt, right? And, um, and 
So what can I say? OK. So no, that's what countries have been doing. What could they be doing? Well, we could just do more of the same, uh, which seems to be the game plan. Uh, let's keep driving nominal interest rates lower because you know, our new Keynesian models tell us that that will fix the problem. Of course, our new Keynesian models also tell us we would never get to this state um, to start with, but that's no reason to uh, change models. Um, or alternatively, we could elevate fiscal policy to the status of monetary policy. In other words, we could actually do something serious with fiscal policy. Um, we could take fiscal actions to address this below target inflation and weak growth. Um, I'm not talking about some solution to long run growth problems here, right? I'm talking about um, trying to get out of this, the muck that we are all mired in right now. Um, and we don't seem to be willing to bring fiscal policy into the picture at all. Um, so the thing is that central banks already are doing exactly what they need to do for this unbacked fiscal expansion to work. They're just pegging interest rates. And in that environment, this unbacked fiscal expansion will, will raise inflation. And if you've got sticky prices and so forth, it'll end up raising output. Um, now, of course, with the history of fiscal expansion, uh, followed closely by austerity, it's going to be pretty hard to convince people you're going to do an unbacked fiscal expansion. Um, Sims refers to current beliefs as hyper-Ricardian. Um, I'm not exactly sure what he means. Uh, but he doesn't mean, he, he certainly means they won't believe that this is an unbacked fiscal expansion. Um, and of course, if people aren't convinced, then you're going to end up, in other words, if people really believe that this debt has to be backed by goods, then uh, you'll end up with higher debt and no economic stimulus. So, um, so what could we do about that? Well, you know, there's all this talk about, about uh, forward guidance with monetary policy. We never talk about it with fiscal policy. We all somehow believe that, oh my god, governments can't pre-commit, therefore we can never talk about future fiscal actions. In fact, fiscal policy pre-commits like crazy, right? We've got, we've got Social Security, we've got Medicare. You have all these programs that the longer they exist, the stronger is the constituency for them, and, and the harder it is to reverse them. Why do you think we build so many tanks in the United States? It's because this is embedded in our, in our well, probably in our DNA. Uh, no, it's, uh, it's all part of the process, right? that you have a lot of, in, of, uh, of interested parties who are making money off of this. And so you can never really do these big fiscal reforms that our models say we can. So I think there's a lot of pre-commitment in, uh, in fiscal policy that we don't exploit. Um, so one possibility is you could say, we're going to run deficits until inflation gets to where we want it to be. And if, if the government really stuck to this plan, then people would end up, would eventually realize that their nominal assets are going to lose value. And that's going to induce them to get rid of them and uh, convert them into uh, buying goods. Um, now, the critical element here, and this is something that uh, I hope I'm making clear, is that growth in nominal debt does not necessarily threaten sustainability. OK? And that's because prices can adjust. And what matters for sustainability is real debt. It's the market value of debt. So policymakers need to understand that there's no necessary conflict between fiscal stimulus and fiscal sustainability. So in a lot of ways, we're in this fortunate situation now where there is no trade-off. We need inflation higher, um, and, we, and so we can, we can issue more bonds. That'll generate the inflation. And the inflation then will make sure that the real value of those bonds doesn't rise. So it's a good situation to be in, believe it or not. Now, you might be thinking, oh my god, no. You start doing that, and we're going to become the Weimar. Um, but there are really only two ways that you can get to a hyperinflation situation. You can either have central banks print up money to buy debt, or you could have the central banks try to fight the inflation that's coming from fiscal policy by constantly raising interest rates. Now, I don't think um, the first is going to happen. Central banks understand that that's the path to, uh, to oblivion. 
Now, whether the second will happen, will, we can assure it will happen is not so clear. Because this is exactly what Brazil did in the late 80s and early 90s. And it now seems to be headed for a similar outcome. So this is a picture of uh, inflation in Brazil. So what was happening was fiscal policy was basically just exogenous. And, monetary, and that was driving inflation up. And the central bank reacted to that by raising the interest rate. And that would then drive inflation up further. So the mechanism here is when the central bank raises interest rates, it increases debt payments. Right? That makes people wealthier. Now, in our new Keynesian models, we assume that taxes are going to rise in the future to eliminate that wealth effect. But in Brazil, that wasn't happening. And um, these days, it looks like it might, be, might happen again. Um, so this is a situation where basically monetary and fiscal policy are, are uh, fighting each other. Um, and fiscal policy in Brazil is um, um, pretty intransigent. Uh, the Constitution indexes government benefits to inflation. So about 90% of government spending can't be touched by the legislature. Um, now, Brazil has lots of other issues, too, uh, as you all know. Uh, but tax, tax increases don't seem to be politically feasible. Um, and so the deficit has been, primary deficit has been growing with no prospect of reversal. And meanwhile, monetary policy doesn't seem to understand that in this environment, it doesn't control inflation any longer. And so um, it's been raising the interest rate to try to fight off the inflation, but then this wealth effect kicks in. Um, and nobody believes that taxes are going to rise in the future to eliminate it. Uh, and so what this aggressive interest rate policy does is it amplifies and it, and it spreads over time this fiscal inflation. So to just give you an example, in December of 2015, the primary deficit was only 1.88% of GDP. But the gross deficit was over 10%. That means there's a lot of debt service. Okay. This is the debt service that, I, that lies behind this wealth effect that I was talking about. And so this is what we've seen happening in Brazil. Inflation goes up, they raise the policy rate, inflation, and it just keeps going up. Now they've kept it flat for quite a while at 14.25%. Um, and maybe you know, inflation is starting to come back down. Now lots of other things were going on in Brazil at the same time. So I'm not claiming that this is the entire story. But it's certainly consistent with an environment where fiscal policy is driving inflation and the central bank is trying to fight it. And that's exacerbating the, the situation. OK. So I think bad outcomes from an unbacked fiscal expansion um, generally are going to stem from monetary policy reacting inappropriately. Um, so uh, once inflation is getting driven by fiscal policy, there's really nothing that the central bank can do to fight it off. Uh, this is something also that central bankers don't understand. Uh, in the, this is a completely different regime than the usual one. It isn't a matter of, oh, well, we'll just raise interest rates um, because uh, that's going to make the situation worse. So all that central banks have to do to make a fit, this unbacked fiscal expansion work is what they're already doing keeping interest rates flat. Um, and basically, at least temporarily, saying, OK, inflation is going to be, is going to be controlled by, uh, by fiscal policy. But the other important thing is that fiscal authorities can't backtrack once they start seeing nominal debt grow. The whole point is to get nominal debt to grow. Um, and, uh, but you know, the history here is, uh, is pretty dicey. Uh, with. Uh, how governments react once nominal debt starts to grow. OK, now there is a historical precedent for this. Um, so I've become an economic historian lately. It's actually pretty cool. Valerie does a lot of this. And now I appreciate her work more than, my, than I used to. Boy, is it hard. <laughs> um, so we're telling this story, we're writing this paper that um, an unbacked fiscal expansion lay behind the recovery in the United States from the Great Depression in 1933. Um, so there have been three years of deflation and very high unemployment. Um, when Roosevelt 
came into office, uh, I mean, he, he was very agnostic, right? He tried lots of different things. But the one thing that he was really committed to was raising the price level. He really wanted to reflate. He didn't quite know how to do it, but, um, but he tried a lot of different things. And the first step was that he left the gold standard. And so what that did was it converted US government debt from effectively being real debt to being nominal debt. Okay, that's a necessary condition. Now he could have still run the same old Hooverian, Hooverian? Hoover, <laughs> the policies of Hoover, um, you know, which was balancing the budget. Uh, in other words, treating this debt as real, um, even though it was nominal. Uh, but, he, but he chose not to, and he was very clever about this. He had this dual budget. He had the normal budget, and he balanced it. And then he had the emergency budget. And he was explicit about saying, I am going to run emergency deficits until the economy turns around. Now, what was the Fed doing then? Nothing. In fact, there wasn't really a coherent Fed policy. Um, in, in back in those days, there were 12 regional Feds. The Board of Governors in Washington had no power. And, um, and the 12 regional Feds each had their own objectives. None of them were thinking about aggregate activity. Uh, so it wasn't until 35, 36, after the period that we're talking, well, during the period, but um, the economy had already started to recover, uh, that there became a coherent Fed policy. Uh, but if you look at interest rates during that time, they weren't doing anything. They were just flat. Okay. Um, sadly, FDR eventually caved in to exactly the same concerns we hear today. Uh, this is one of the things that doing economic history does for you, is it depresses you. Uh, because you hear exactly the same arguments today that we heard in 1933. Now, oh, there's going to be hyperinflation. Oh my God, we can't do this. Uh, we have to balance the budget. Uh, all these arguments uh, were, were in play uh, in the 30s. And eventually, he ended up backtracking and uh, raised taxes and cut spending in 1937. And lo and behold, we had another recession. Now, other things happened, too. Most people blame that recession on the Fed, uh, raising reserve requirements. But I'm not convinced that that's the, that that's the whole story. And as a consequence, the recovery was incomplete. And the price level didn't even return to its 1920s levels until after World War II. So, um, but I think this does show that the kind of unbacked fiscal expansion that I'm talking about can work and has worked in the past. Um, and, and the trick here, which Roosevelt figured out, is how do you sell it politically? OK, so what could the euro area do? Well, they could create a mechanism for unbacked fiscal expansions. And that mechanism would work through euro bonds, which, of course, the Germans won't allow. Um, but what you need is an entity with some small taxing capacity, because the, ba the bonds have to be backed, right? And this entity could buy all the sovereign bonds out there and issue euro bonds. Um, and then the real value of those euro bonds would depend on a euro-wide price level. Um, but as I said, the euro bonds are off the table. Um, and so, and all the arguments end up amounting to saying, we got to treat debt as real debt, um, not nominal debt. Um, but even Draghi is, is, uh, is feeling some frustration that uh, fiscal policy is just kind of getting in the way of economic recovery. Okay, so I'm, uh, I'm going to wrap up. Um, I think our discussion about fiscal policy is really full of cliches, misinformation, and mixed messages. So I like to pick on the IMF. Um, this is actually Susan Yang's fault. She is the representative of the IMF here. Uh, so the IMF, you know, is big on, on catchy phrases. So fiscal action should be timely, targeted, and temporary. I don't, want, I don't know what any of those things, words mean. Um, Trichet uh, publicly talked about how uh, fiscal austerity will actually lead to economic growth. So he bought into the, the literature about um, 
um, expansionary fiscal consolidations without understanding the literature and just applying it to every country in Europe. Um, Obama, I, 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 I had a cow when he did this. So, you know, he pushed through this big expansion in 2009. And in less than a week after that, he held a press conference where he announced, I will cut the deficit in half by the end of my first year. You either expand or you don't. You don't announce an expansion and a consolidation um, at the same time. And for the kind of effects that I'm thinking about, you don't do that. Okay. This is kind of going back to, um, I don't know, intermediate macro ISLM thinking that it's all about G and T, right? It's about gin and tonic uh, fiscal policy. Um, and what I'm talking about is government debt. I don't really care how you generate that debt. You can just print it up and send it out. Um, it, this isn't about fiscal multipliers. It's about asset substitution. It's about discouraging people from holding paper money. That's what this mechanism is all about. And, um, and when you have an announcement like Obama's, you're basically saying, we're going to back this, this deficit, this debt, with real, with real goods. And once you do that, you throw away all the expansionary power that you, that you might have generated. Uh, Dombrovskis. Uh, is, was the Prime Minister of Latvia, um, and his argument was that fiscal policy can't commit, commit to future actions, and so they did this massive budget cut, and GDP fell by 22%. Um, but he was very proud of that action. Um, and my, my point here isn't to pick on him, it's that you know, I think you can commit to future actions. We do it all the time with fiscal policy. And to claim that you have to front load these, this fiscal austerity when you're at the trough of this cycle um, is crazy, I think. And then the IMF is now telling everyone that they should be doing growth-friendly fiscal rebalancing. You'll have to ask Susan what that means. Um, now, my view is that all of these amount to choosing to wear a fiscal straitjacket. Um, okay, so the first version of this talk I gave at University of Cambridge, so I thought that I should be a, a Keynesian, as we say. Um, and in fact, what's really cool is the, the room that I was in had one of Philip's original hydraulic machines. You guys know that he had this, this description of the macro economy that was all water flowing through pipes. And, and, uh, and Cambridge has one of the original uh, units. Uh, there's another one in New Zealand. Um, anyway, so I was, I was uh, you know, really into this Keynesian thing. And I, 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 I genuinely believe that what, um, what I'm proposing is taking Keynes's reasoning into an intertemporal environment. Um, this unbacked fiscal expansion is, is pure Keynesian logic, but again, it's not the way we've bastardized Keynesian stuff into G and T. It's, it's that you can stimulate aggregate demand by encouraging people to get rid of their nominal assets and buy goods. Um, as I alluded to, today we have um, a divine coincidence, which new Keynesians like, um, where we want both higher inflation and stable debt GDP. And the proposal that I'm making delivers both of those. So there isn't a trade-off. We're not facing a trade-off right now because we have nominal debt. Um, so just as countries were free to leave the gold standard in Keynes's day, we are free today to exploit the latitude that nominal debt offers. And so I'm going to paraphrase uh, Keynes. We must not allow policymakers to put us back in the real debt cage. He said gold. Uh, in the real debt cage, where we have been pining our hearts out all these years. Um, so my thinking is, you know, being on the gold standard and treating nominal debt as real debt are equivalent. And um, so that's where I am. So happy to have questions if you have any. Or not. <laughs>
Yes, sir. No, it, it, if the EU were to create euro bonds, then they could have the same divine coincidence. Um, but uh, right, I think I think it's it's undoable in almost every country. You know, so Japan seems to have bought into what the IMF tells them to do. Um, and so they're probably going to raise consumption taxes again. Um, in the US, well, I mean, the US is such a basket case these days. I can't imagine it coming up with any coherent economic <laughs> policy. But there's just no, uh, there's no, and, and the US also doesn't have as much of a low inflation problem as these other countries do. Um, but Sweden and Switzerland are good examples where they've got, you know, there is no conflict and they choose not to, uh, to do this. So I, I can't explain it other than, you're right, it's politics. But, you know, I feel like our job is to keep pushing on, <laughs> on what we think is true. Yes, sir. No, 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 no. I, I think you misunderstood me, or I misspoke. Um, what, what I was trying to argue was that if they had an expanded role, so the, the, the EFSB, um, or whatever it's called, <laughs> there's too many initials in Europe, um, isn't doing what I had in mind. What I had in mind was that you would have these euro bonds, and, um, and the euro bonds, in that case, there would be a single price level that prices those. Okay. Now, each country would still have its own price level, as it does now. Um, but there's a lot about Europe that's puzzling. Uh, for example, I don't think we actually understand very well why uh, inflation processes are so different across countries in Europe. Um, I mean, we know some of that, about that, but I'm not sure that we have the theory that we need to understand um, exactly how prices are getting determined there. Um, but anyway, yeah, I, I meant that we could treat it as, if we had euro bonds in, it, in this expanded role that I had in mind, then there would be a price level that would price those bonds. And that would, have, that would then emanate out to the other uh, prices in the, in the euro area. <laughs>